Thank you very much. I'd uh, like to first thank uh, CBS and the conference organizers, all of the other presenters and all of the participants. It's a really great honor to be here today. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of an outlier in that my training uh, is in literary study and aesthetic theory uh, rather than Buddhist or religious studies. Um, and for those of us who are in literary study and the humanities in the United States, we're used to trying to convince other people that what we do isn't a bunch of frivolous nonsense. So I think that background will be will suit me well for today. So the title of my paper is uh, Aesthetic Techniques as Skillful Means. Uh, and uh, I'll just uh, let the paper do the talking. Uh, so Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche remarked in his 1974 letter for the inaugural summer program at Naropa Institute that, quote, in meditative art, the artist embodies the viewer as well as the creator of the works. Vision is not separate from operation, and there is no fear of being clumsy or failing to achieve his aspiration. This statement, vision is not separate from operation, expresses the unity of wisdom and skillful means. Vision or experience and operation or practical activity should function uh, in a unified manner. And this is a distinctly tantric sentiment, uh, as David Gordon White suggests when he writes that one might characterize the range of tantric uses of templates and media as a continuum extending from doing to knowing. Trungpa's statement suggests that in art, as in Dharma practice, doing and knowing should form a unity. And in drawing this equivalence, Trungpa also expresses the central concerns of the Western avant-garde, as I hope to, to show in what follows. So in this paper, I seek to explain what made America's first accredited Vajrayana Buddhist-oriented college into the major hub for the American avant-garde that it became in the early 1970s. And part of what's involved here is, is I'd like to suggest that an accurate conception of uh, aesthetics in a philosophical sense is the closest analog that we find in secular societies to a concept of yoga. I'm not saying they're, they're exactly the same, but I'm saying there are fundamental uh, compatibilities between the Western concept of aesthetics. So to understand uh, what made the Vajrayana and the avant-garde so well matched in the later 20th century, we have to first remember that art uh, it, as a category hasn't been fixed uh, or static in the West, uh, at least since what Walter Benjamin called the emergence of the secular cult of beauty during the Renaissance. So by Vajrayana art here, I don't mean Tonka paintings or frescoes and lakhangs, uh, but rather the distinctly modern uh, Western concept of art that um, as a category that's distinct from religious iconography, from craft, from architecture, from civic planning, uh, that emerges with the functional differentiation of society uh, that accompanies the beginnings of humanist thought. This history defines art's development in the West, beginning with Romanticism's turn away from regarding art as a means of representing the external world and toward what's known as an expressivist understanding, whereby art enables its maker to externalize the unique vital substance of the psyche. And this is where we find the beginnings of aesthetics as a philosophical discourse, which the philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel defined as, quote, a science of feelings and or science of sensation. And really what he means is it's a science of first personal phenomenological experience. So the avant-garde in particular begins both as an extension of romanticism's interest in making art into the domain where first-person experience could be explored in a rigorous way, and it also signals romanticism's decline as artists grew dissatisfied with the aesthetic techniques that romanticism had provided and sought to transform them. So at the turn of the 20th century, artists working primarily in France, Germany, and Italy discovered that the technical conventions of the art tradition, such as skills for producing the illusion of perspective, shape, color, and so on, could yield transformative new experiential outcomes if placed in service of the act, process, and event of making itself, rather than of representing an external content. So art at this point stops functioning as a form of representation and instead becomes a way of experiencing. 
right? Art becomes a technique for experiencing the world in a particular way. And this, I think, is what we have to hear behind Trungpa's statement that vision is not separate from operation. This idea was, became programmatic for movements like Dada and Surrealism, which saw art as a range of practical actions that produced distinctive experiential situations. But the initial wave of pre-war art in movements like Cubism, German Expressionism, and Futurism already made clear that the new art did not represent any external subject matter. These are known as non-representational or abstract artworks. This art isn't about anything other than what one experiences through one's own engagement with the structure of the work. And in this respect, I think art increasingly comes to resemble a kind of contemplative practice, a way of reflecting experientially on the underlying conditions of experience. So for this reason, I don't think we should be surprised to find many avant-garde artists such as Vasily Kandinsky, René Domal, and Antonin Artaud were drawing upon the language of mystical traditions to explain what they were trying to do in their work. For American artists operating, uh, continuing the avant-garde project after the Second World War, Buddhism provided a major touchstone from early on. For instance, uh, with the experimental composer John Cage, uh, featured in the photo here, drawing upon the work of D.T. Suzuki in the Zen tradition, that's Suzuki Roshi, who he's shaking hands with in this photo, uh, in his development of chance-based methods of composition that aimed at removing the compositional process from the artist's self-conscious control. So it's taking art, the composition outside of the artist's own ego. So this was the state of art, uh, Western art, at the beginning of uh, that, that made Western cultures receptive to the Vajrayana during the initial migration of Vajrayana teachers uh, with the beginning of the uh, Tibetan diaspora in the 1950s. So while it was nothing new for artists to be interested in mysticism, yoga, even forms of ritual magic, the direct tutelary relationships with lineage holders that we find during the period of the 1970s were a new phenomenon. Uh, this is an artist, uh, John Giorno, with His Holiness Dujim Rinpoche, who, who he took as his teacher. So what began to happen in the 1970s was the direct transmission of elements of the Vajrayana view from lineage holders to artists, and those artists' subsequent translation of that view into various kinds of aesthetic practice. So I'd like to provide just a few examples of this uh, before offering some concluding thoughts on why it might be significant. And all the examples I've chosen are from artists that, dis in particular, who took formal Buddhist vows and received empowerments and engaged in uh, uh, fairly long-standing uh, relationships, teacher-student relationships with Tibetan lamas. So possibly the most well-known American Buddhist poet, uh, Allen Ginsberg uh, was an early student of Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. Trungpa Rinpoche invited Ginsberg and Ann Waldman to found the Naropa Institute's poetics program in the summer of 1974, when the school's roster of attendees really functioned as a kind of who's who of, of names from the art and literary world. People like John Cage, Meredith Monk, Diane De Prima, Amiri Baraka, Robert Creeley, and major figures from, from uh, the American art scene. So the example I've chosen from Ginsburg's work is a, is a work called Mind Writing Slogans that he published in 1994, which draws upon Chikawa Yeshe Dorje's 12th century collection of Lojong aphorisms, and also on the tantric ground path and fruition schema that one finds in Dzogchen texts. Ginsburg's treatise assembles a collection of pithy quotations or slogans called from both literary and Buddhist sources in order to provide a set of general precepts aiding in the process of poetic composition. And here are a few examples here. So you can see that the, it's divided into three sections, including background, path, and fruition. Poetic composition, as presented by Ginsburg's mind writing slogans, consists not in, primarily in the production of elegant verses, but in the ongoing moment to moment cultivation of attention to the particulars of lived experience. This cultivated awareness itself becomes the aim and end of poetry, rather than the verbal artifacts that are merely its byproduct. So we can see Ginsburg here applying the logic, a kind of logic, of the resultant vehicle shown in the ground, path, and fruition model. Uh, and applying it to the inseparability of process and product that one finds in avant-garde poetry. Another poet, Ann Waldman, 
uh, articulates the relevance of Vajrayana view to her work in prose essays such as Fast Speaking Woman and the Dakini Principle and Poetry a City, uh, and builds her poetics around a distinctly uh, oral and performance-based conception of the poem as a kind of enacted ritual event. Describing the convergences between her performance poetics and Buddhist Tantra, Waldman treats the Sanskrit term city as, quote, the pivotal word of her practice, defining city as a kind of synaptical energy. I'm going to move fairly quickly forward to the next one. This is just a quote from Waldman describing the influence of this concept on her work. Uh, another uh, poet, uh, Jackson McClough, relied on uh, chance-based compositions uh, that developed by John Cage, and in a series called the Gata Poems, uh, McClough would take traditional uh, mantra and scriptural verses, break them into their individual phonemic units, and then rearrange those units according to a process of generating random combinations. So this is the, a piece called the Mani Mani Gata, which uses the Chenrezig mantra, O Mani Padme Hom, into which McClough had been initiated by Kala Rinpoche as its source text. So you can see it here, it says O Mani Padme Hom vertically, but the, the, the arrangement here functions as a, as a sort of model for reading horizontally. So you rearrange the units A, U, M, O, and read horizontally. Uh, so by recombining the phonemes of the mantra into a chance-based composition, it would yield a new spontaneously arisen sonic arrangement that would aim to retain something of the properties of the seed syllables comprising the original mantra while also freeing those parts from their fixed function within the mantric formula to produce a new event. So these are two other examples of McClough's work. This is the first Milarepa Gata, which uses the supplication J. Mila Jadpa Dorje La Solwa Debso as a source text, and the Tara Gata, uh, which draws upon uh, the Tara Mantra. So I'm running out of time here. Another poet, John Giorno, uh, met His Holiness Dujam Rinpoche on a trip to India, became his, his student. Uh, Giorno's uh, work... Uh, just an example from it here. I don't have enough time to go into a longer description of his work. Uh, Jarno uses these icono iconographic uh, sort of uh, signs. It's hard to read here, but it, this says, words uh, arise from sound, sound comes from wisdom, wisdom comes from emptiness. And a lot of the way the piece works is on the interaction between the semantic content of the words and the words sort of purely image-based value as, as kind of graphic icons. So uh, poets were not the only ones that were collaborating uh, with teachers. Just as a couple of final examples, in 1972, Trungpa began working with members of the Experimental Open Theater to produce a set of theater-based practices that would become known as Mudra Space Awareness. Uh, Craig Warren Smith describes, a member of the Mudra Space Awareness Group, describes this as being based on the principle that, quote, any form of doing can be based uh, can be a vehicle for awareness of direct experience. By breaking everyday experience into its component parts and then seeing how those component parts fit together, we can begin to appreciate the intrinsic nature of the activity. So these examples remain relevant to us today insofar as they offer precedents and templates for what might, one might see as a best-case scenario for a possible cross-cultural synthesis or at least encounter between so-called modernity and Vajrayana Buddhism. The works we've been, I've been showing seek to marshal the era's most advanced techniques of aesthetic composition in service of soteriological aims that are fundamentally aligned with those of Buddhist practice. This is what it means to see art not as a leisure activity, but as a means of psychological transformation. Tutelary relationships with lamas provided these artists with traditional resources with which to ground their aesthetic experiments in ongoing personal projects of self-transformation. While the artist's means of communication and expression provided teachers with skillful means for making the Dharma accessible to sensibilities of modern societies. In many ways, the presence of an avant-garde was essential to the initial transmission of the Dharma to the West in the first place because it provided culture receptive conditions within the culture for receiving the traditions. While cultural misappropriation is always a risk in, in cross-cultural encounters, avant-garde aesthetics inherently tend to preserve and respect the self-secrecy of esoteric Buddhism because the, the perspectives they provide remain implicit. 
and depend on audience participation. Right? In a sense, aesthetic appreciation serves a function analogous to a kind of initiation. And just to provide a couple of final examples, in the 21st century, Dharma teachers in the West have continued this precedent with Zigger Kongtrul producing work in abstract expressionist painting, and uh, uh, Dzongsar Kensei Rinpoche's work in cinema is also well known. So that's time for uh, today. Thank you for listening. And Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Uh, uh.